In this video, we study the basics of MOSFET operation. Of course, you're already familiar with the resistor. That's a two-terminal device where the current flowing between the two terminals depends on the voltage across them. A transistor is a device with three or more terminals where the current through two terminals of the device depends on the voltage on a third terminal or between a third and fourth terminal. In many cases of the transistor, two of the terminals may be shorted together, so you end up with a three-terminal device. Now, the diode is also a two-terminal device where the current between the two terminals is related to the voltage across them. But in that case, the relationship is nonlinear. The same is true for transistors. This nonlinear relationship and the ability to control current flow using voltage at a third terminal allows us to perform many interesting functions, including digital logic and voltage amplification. There are many different types of transistors, but in this video, we're gonna study the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, or MOSFET for short, which is by far the most commonly found in practice today. Shown here is an example of a MOSFET, and on the right is its cross-sectional side view. Now in this particular MOSFET, you see that there are two regions that are doped N-type, separated by an intervening region that's doped P-type. There are four terminals in this MOSFET. The N-type terminals are labeled source, S, and drain, D. These are separated by a P-type region. And just above the P-type region is the gate terminal, labeled G here. And it, that's made out of a conductor, which may be metal. Now looking at the cross-sectional view, you see the reason for the name MOSFET. The key channel region indicated here is composed of a stack of metal, an insulator, which is generally silicon dioxide for silicon MOSFETs, and semiconductor, in this case, silicon. So you've got metal oxide semiconductor sandwich here, MOS for short, and we'll see that the transistor is controlled by means of modulating the electric field. So hence, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. The fourth terminal is the body, which is a large P substrate in which the two uh, N-type regions, the source and the drain, are fabricated. You may recall that with zero volts applied across the PN junctions formed between body, source, and drain, or with reverse bias applied, we'll see a depletion region formed around the source and drain regions, electrically insulating them from the body terminal. The gate terminal is very well electrically insulated by the oxide itself. So in this state, with no voltage applied to source, drain, or gate, all four terminals are electrically isolated from each other and no current can flow. The region under the gate between the source and drain is called the channel region. Under the right conditions, a conducting channel forms here, allowing current to flow between drain and source. The distance between source and drain is called the channel length and is represented by the symbol L. Typical values for L might be on the range of a few nanometers up to a few micrometers. The channel width is the dimension into the screen in this cross section. And it's represented with the symbol W typically. Typical values for channel width are in the range of tens of nanometers up to hundreds of micrometers. Of course, there's quite a bit of variation in these values. The insulating oxide layer underneath the gate is engineered to be very thin so that applying a voltage on the gate will induce an electric field in the channel region, the so-called field effect. 
typical values for that thickness, thickness of the oxide T ox, can be as thin as a nanometer or even less. The source and drain regions are heavily doped, as indicated by the little superscript plus sign here. So they're conductors. But remember that in so-called enhancement mode MOSFETs, with zero voltages applied between all terminals, they're separated by depletion regions from each other, so no current flows between them. The device as it's pictured here is symmetric. In fact, physically, there can be little difference between the drain and source regions most of the time. So we generally identify the drain simply as the terminal with the higher voltage on it. Thus, we'll often short together the body and the source. To ensure both PN junctions between source and body and drain and body remain reverse biased, so no current flows into or out of the body, and we can consider the MOSFET as simply a three terminal device. Next, we consider what happens with the source, drain, and body re regions all shorted to ground and a positive voltage VGS applied to the gate. This induces an electric field from gate down to the body, which attracts negative charge carriers, electrons, to the surface of the MOSFET, the channel region immediately below the gate. In this state, the channel is said to be inverted because it's gone from being P-type to now being N-type. The source and drain regions are now connected by a conducting N-type channel, and current can flow between them. Thus, this type of device is called an N-channel MOSFET. or an NMOS device sometimes for short. Notice that in this condition, there's still zero bias between the source drain and channel region and the body terminal. So the depletion region still exists, electrically insulating the channel from the body. No current can flow in or out of the body. Similarly, the gate is electrically insulated from the channel region by the oxide layer. So no current flows in or out of the gate either. Current can only flow between drain and source. The minimum voltage, VGS, required to induce a channel is called the threshold voltage. And is represented by the symbol V, the subscript T. You'll sometimes see the letter N in the subscript as well to indicate that this is an N-channel MOSFET. We define the overdrive voltage with the symbol VOV as the amount by which the gate source voltage exceeds the threshold voltage, that is VGS minus VT. This is a key parameter that tells us how inverted the channel really is. We also define a per unit area capacitance for the parallel plate capacitor formed between the gate and the channel. We use the symbol Cox to denote this per unit area capacitance. And it's an, also an important parameter of the MOSFET because it gives us uh, a feel for how strong the field effect is. Now, like any parallel plate capacitor, it's simply given by the relative permittivity of the insulator, in this case, silicon dioxide, which has a relative permittivity of about 3.9 epsilon naught, and the thickness of the insulating layer, in this case, the thickness of the silicon dioxide. Since this is a per unit area capacitance, the total gate capacitance is C ox times the area of the gate. It's width times its length. Typically, gate capacitance values would be in the range of femtofarads, depending completely on the gate area, of course. Finally, we can write in a simple expression for the charge in the channel region. It 
in this case, it's negative charge carriers electrons. Now let's just write the expression for the absolute value of the charge in the channel region. It's the total capacitance, C ox W L, times the overdrive voltage, V O B. So far, we focused on the N channel MOSFET or N MOS device, but many or most electronic circuits will also make use of P channel MOSFETs or P MOS devices. These have a P type source and drain region embedded in an N type substrate for the body. In this case, to ensure a depletion region keeps the body terminal insulated from the source and drain, the body is connected to the higher of the two terminal voltages. In the PMOS device, unlike the NMOS device, the terminal with the higher voltage is actually the source. In this so-called enhancement mode MOSFET, a sufficiently negative voltage must be applied to the gate to increase the concentration of holes in the channel region and therefore create an inverted channel that allows current to flow between the P-type drain and P-type source. Thus, strictly speaking, the threshold voltage for an enhancement mode PMOS device is negative. And VGS must be lower than that in order to induce a channel. However, we may often prefer to avoid all the negative signs and simply refer to the absolute values of the gate source and threshold voltages. So we can define the absolute overdrive voltage as just being the difference between VGS and VTP. When we do this, we just have to be careful to make sure to remember that for PMOS devices, the gate has to be at a lower, more negative voltage than the source to invert the channel so that you don't get the polarities confused. Since so many useful circuits can be made by combining both NMOS and PMOS devices, the most popular manufacturing technology for making semiconductor devices is the so-called complementary MOS or CMOS technology. Using this technology, both NMOS and PMOS devices can be fabricated side by side in a shared silicon substrate. Shown here is a typical cross-section. We begin with a P-type substrate for all devices into which more heavily doped n-type regions are deposited creating the source and drain of nmos transistors a gate region is formed above allowing a field effect to induce a channel for the nmos transistors here meanwhile separate larger n wells are created elsewhere in the p-type substrate into which further dopants are introduced to introduce even more heavily doped p-type source and drain regions for pmos devices a reverse bias is maintained between this n well body and the p-type substrate during operation so they're insulated from each other and no current ever flows here or between the n well body and the drain and source of the pmos devices contained therein Additional oxide regions are grown or trenched between transistors. This keeps them insulated from each other, even when they're very closely spaced. Using this manufacturing technology, millions or even billions of transistors can be fabricated on a single chip with relatively low cost. As a result, CMOS technology is now the dominant semiconductor manufacturing technology and has enabled everything from very high performance computing to very low cost sensors.